Now, I'm no weather expert by any means, but I certainly know when it's raining, and I can safely say we've had the wettest start to the year since, well, at least last year. You know, two weeks, and we've had some form of rain pretty much every day. And for a workshop full of tools, that's never a good sign. Now, before the New Year's, I made sure to give everything a good coating of oil to protect it, but apparently I must have managed to miss a few things. But thankfully, it's only a small amount of surface rust on a few tools, but I would like to keep that to a minimum. Now, for most of the big tools, a good coating of oil works fine, but for most of the hand tools that I use every day, I'd rather find an alternative method if possible. You know, between lathing and milling, I do have to set up the camera in between shots, and I know all too well that my camera does not like getting oil in all the buttons. I had to replace the entire back panel with all the buttons last year, and that was a pretty expensive thing to do. Now, I did a bit of digging in some books to see what methods were out there. You know, the black book, apart from suggesting a few black oxides, was a little bit unhelpful on methods, but it did get me thinking about plating. I remember that Clickspring did some plating too in his workshop not too long ago, so it's definitely possible to do in a home workshop environment. Although what he did was gold plating, and as much as I'd like to gold plate everything that goes on my lathe, that would be a little bit outside of the budget that I'm working with. So with the gold plating ruled out, I did a bit more digging and I found out that nickel plating is quite a popular method for doing at home. And whilst I was somewhat familiar with nickel plating, it never occurred to me that you could do it in a home workshop. Now why specifically nickel? Well for one, it's resistant to corrosion in a normal atmospheric environment, which is really what I'm looking for. And if I do it correctly, we should be able to get a fairly even coating on the part. And to give you some idea of what nickel plating can do, this is a set of vice grips that are probably 20 or 25 years old now, and apart from the areas where the nickel has been chipped away, the rest of it looks as good as it was the day that it came out of the factory. And if you look around your house, you'll be pretty surprised with just how much stuff is nickel plated. Now at this point, I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, why not use stainless? And that's a good question. What I have here is a piece of 14401 stainless, better known as 316L. And 316L is a relatively common form of stainless and it's extremely corrosion resistant. But unless I have to use stainless, I avoid it if I can. It's a very unpleasant material to machine. You know, it's very hard to cut. It takes a lot of horsepower and it takes a lot of life out of the tools, at least compared to most carbon steels. You know, there are better machining alloys out there, such as 303 grade, but that's an alloy we just don't get around here, so what I'm mostly left with is 316, and it just stinks to machine. And also because of the chromium content, you'll find that stainless is quite expensive to buy, at least compared to, say, mild steel. And finally, the biggest reason why I don't use it is because I'm very limited in the shapes and sizes that I can get it with. You know, mostly with mild steel, I'm able to get it in most sizes and cut to very short lengths. But for stainless, it's mostly round bar or thin plate like this. And if I want any other sizes, I'd have to order several meters of it just to satisfy the minimum order requirements for custom sized metal. And it's for those reasons why I generally stick to low carbon steel for most of the work that I do. Now when it comes to electroplating, I do want to stress here that what I'm aiming to get is a good home-based result. What I'm doing this for is mostly for rust resistance and decorative reasons. I'm not expecting a factory grade plating result, and as you'll see later in the video, there are many factors and additives that go into a proper nickel plating setup that I won't be able to do here. With that said though, I am hoping that we can get a good result and a result that should be able to get us some good corrosion resistance on some of my tools. So let's get started. The first thing we'll need is a piece of nickel, which you can buy off eBay. You know, I got this piece here, I think it's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and I got it for about 20 bucks. You can buy thin strips that are meant for electroplating, but I found that you can get a lot more metal by buying a big piece and then cutting it up with some aviation snips. You're also going to need a power supply. I know some people on YouTube have laboratory grade power supplies where you can control the current and the voltage, but here we do things a little bit differently and I'm simply going with a 6 or 12 volt battery charger. You'll also need a bottle of cleaning vinegar, which will make the electrolyte. 
This stuff here is 5% acetic acid, and make sure you get the stuff that is non-fermented. You'll also need some salt and a tub to mix it in. Now the first thing we need to do is get the nickel in its current form, as a solid, into a solution which we can then use to plate stuff with. So what I'll do is I'll add the vinegar to the tub and add a bit of salt to the solution to make the whole solution a bit more conductive. I'll then add the two strips into the solution, connecting one end to the positive and then one end to the negative. I'll now turn on the charger and very quickly we'll start to see bubbles forming at the cathode. This stuff here is hydrogen and for that reason I'm keeping the workspace well ventilated to get rid of it. Now whilst the cathode will be forming bubbles, not much is going to be happening at the anode, or at least visually, but this is really where all the magic is going to be happening because the nickel ions are going to be pulled into the solution. This is going to form our electrolyte solution, which in this case is going to be nickel acetate, and that's going to show up as a green colour in the liquid. Now this is definitely not a fast process. It took about 30 minutes for the green tinge to show up, and in total I left it for about 3 hours to become more concentrated. That might sound like a while, but that is mostly unattended work. Just check on it periodically to make sure the solution isn't overheating because even at only 3 to 4 amps at 12 volts, it is enough for it to get noticeably warm after a while. Now if you're using a basic power supply like I am, you can simply move the strips further away from each other to lower the current or you can simply switch it from 12 volts to 6 volts and that will give you the same effect. At the end of the day, what we're really focusing on here is the amperage, not the voltage. And if you really want to know why, it's all tied up in Faraday's laws of electrolysis, which we can actually use to roughly estimate how long it might take to dissolve the nickel. You know, it takes one amp of current for one hour to dissolve roughly 1.1 grams of nickel into the solution. I had it at about three amps most of the time for the two hours that I ran it, so I should have dissolved about 6.6 .6 grams in total. Obviously it won't be this much because it's not 100% efficient, but it should give us a rough estimate. And you can definitely see just how much has dissolved into the solution. It should be also pointed out here that the cathode has picked up some nickel too from the process, but not as much as has been put into the solution. There's also a bunch of black particulate matter left at the bottom. I believe this is insoluble impurities from the nickel plate, and I will need to filter that out. Having done a bit of further research, I discovered that there are things called anode bags which are designed for the anodes to be placed in and they do help to contain the impurities that are left over from this process. Obviously I didn't have any this time, but I might look into getting some in the future. Anyway, let's do a bit of testing. What I have here is a piece of mild steel which I'll put in the lathe and polish it up at the end. The coating that I'm going for is only going to be a few microns thick so the surface texture of the part is going to be carried over once we electroplate it. Then I'll connect the cathode to the piece of steel, and then I'll connect the anode to the nickel strip. And then I'll put it in the acetate solution, and then turn on the power supply. And rather quickly, the colour will change very slightly to a whiter, more titanium-like colour, as the nickel ions will get deposited onto the steel. And this is the final result. You know, it's not too different from the original steel colour. However, one thing I wasn't expecting was the colour came out quite dull, which is quite different from the other nickel plating which I've seen. Now, further research would suggest that there are additives which are used in commercial nickel plating solutions to address this specific issue. At least from what I can find out, things such as benzene sulfonic acid, which is a type of brightening or carrying agent, is commonly added to the solution to help change the grain structure of the nickel as it forms, and that helps to brighten the colour of it. And it's probably no surprise that you can't simply go and buy that. So given that this is a very basic home plating setup, we're going to have to forego that, at least for the moment. The nickel plating is also not as hard as what I was hoping for. You know, hard nickel plating is a thing, and it's quite obvious that the nickel plating that I've done is not hard nickel. Don't get me wrong, it's definitely harder than the mild steel on which it has been deposited on, but it can definitely be scratched. And again, doing further research, it does seem that there are certain steps that you need to do to form hard nickel. 
For instance, you have to rely on close pH and temperature monitoring of the solution, and you do need to add ammonium chloride and boric acid and a few other things in order to get this type of coating. It's certainly not impossible to do here, but it's definitely outside the bounds of my current equipment. What matters the most to me, at least in the scope of this current video, is, is the coating corrosion resistant? So what I did was I got a second test piece and I gave it a very similar coating to the first. I then gave it a good coating of salt water and then left it overnight to dry. And this is the result. You can clearly see the points at which the nickel stops and the rust starts. And that goes to show that even a very thin coating of nickel plating is very corrosion resistant. I'd say this is a really great result. It's also worth noting though that I wasn't able to sand down some of the grooves at the bottom of the part and there must have been some oxide or contamination inside the grooves because they obviously didn't receive any nickel plating and they have corroded. So with the basic testing done, I'll try and place a quick change tool holder since it was one of the things that did rust. Now cleaning it up with acetone obviously wasn't enough to get a good plating, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to electro clean the tool holder before I plate it. I know some people do essentially the same thing by pickling the metal in acid, but I prefer to do it with electrolysis. And the method for doing this is quite simple. You add sodium carbonate to water, and you hook the anode to a sacrificial piece of scrap metal, and then you hook the cathode to the workpiece, and then you simply leave it for a few hours. This way, any oxidation in hard to reach places should be removed. When it comes to plating this time round, I'm going to set up an anode on each side of the tool holder to try and provide a more even current. In total, I gave it about 20 minutes in the plating solution, which should be enough time. And that is the final result. All in all, I think it looks just okay. There's a bit of discoloration at the top edge. I'm not exactly sure why that's the case, but it could be down to contamination in the solution or uneven current. The important thing though is the tool post is now coated in a coating which should be resistant to corrosion as long as I don't scratch it up all that much. And as of publishing this video, it's been about a month since I've added the coating to the tool holder and thankfully I can report that it's held up quite well. There's a few light scratches which hasn't broken through the coating and there hasn't been any flaking or cracking in the coating itself. All in all, I'm pretty impressed. For a very basic home setup, I think these are the results that you could expect to get from this type of setup. I'm sure there are ways of improving it and I'm sure I will try to improve it sometime in the future, but at least for the moment, I have ways of making my tools become rust resistant, which is what I was needing. Final thing left to do is put the solution in a container and store it for future use. On a very final note, I didn't do it here obviously, but as I use the solution in the future, I will need to monitor the pH and add acid to keep the pH between 3.5 and 4.5. As I understand it, the pH will raise over time, so it will need to be monitored and brought back if it gets too high. And that's about it. I hope you enjoyed this video, thank you very much for watching, see you next week.